Lesson 1.3 is on rocks and minerals. In part A, we'll be covering minerals, and let's look at our rules and definitions. And so I have some more conversions here for you to do, and you need to memorize these if you don't have them memorized already. As I mentioned in lesson two, it depends on what math curriculum you're using. Math is a language of science. Some math curriculums, like Saxon math, they teach math as a language a little better than other ones do. And so you're probably already familiar with conversion factors, and you may already have all these memorized. But if I gave you something like 10 meters, and I wanted to know how many inches that was, well, you can look at these and think, well, one meter, that has 100 centimeters, and then I can convert from centimeters from metric to English right here, 2.54 centimeters in one inch. So I can convert from meters to centimeters first, and I would say 100 cm over one meter. Remember, we want those units to cancel. And so we can see that there we have meter over meter. That's going to cancel. And then we can continue then one inch over 2.54 centimeters. And so our centimeters will cancel there. And we're left with those units of inches. And so now for multiplying, we would be doing 10 times 100, which would just be 1,000, over 2.54. And so that would equal 393.7 inches. That's how many inches are in 10 meters. And so I had to use two unit multipliers. That's the same thing as a conversion factor. Sometimes they're called unit multipliers. Unit, sometimes in math, that means one. So unity means one. And conversion factors, they almost always have a one in them. So we have one meter equals 100 centimeters. One inch equals 2.54. One kilometer equals 1,000 meters. So be familiar with how to convert using two unit multipliers, not just one. And try to memorize this scripture. That would be the ideal thing to do here is to memorize these verses. It's 2 Samuel 22, verse 2. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. So scripture uses analogies of the earth and earth materials many times because those are things we're familiar with. We understand what a rock means, something strong, something unmovable. The Lord is my rock. And then here's your definitions. Remember, you're supposed to do your rules and definitions on one day. And so do that. Then another day, do lesson A. Another day, do lesson B. And then day four, do your activity. So let's start the lesson. And there's three parts. The first part is on minerals. What are minerals? And we've already talked about this. Some minerals are the building blocks of rocks. Lesson 1.2, we covered that elements, those are the building blocks of minerals. So we're kind of going from smaller to bigger here. We learned about smaller things, elements. Those are the building blocks of minerals. And some different things about minerals, these are good to remember and to write down. Minerals are naturally occurring. They're inorganic, solid substances. Inorganic means that they're not made by living things normally. And just remember, though, that's how we try to classify minerals. Oysters, they make shells out of calcium carbonate, which is also just found naturally in an inorganic form. And they're solid as well. So water is not a mineral, but ice is a mineral. They have a definite composition, and that helps us identify them. So we've talked about quartz, SiO2. When we find something and a scientist does an elemental analysis on it and figures out that for every two oxygens there's one silicon in this material, then he or she is confident that that material is quartz and that it's not calcium carbonate or dolomite or something else. And so minerals, they also have a characteristic crystal structure. They have characteristic colors, hardnesses. You'll be learning about mineral hardness in Lab Activity 1.4. And you're already familiar with some minerals from both your lecture and your facts practice. So let's look at one that we've talked about already, sodium chloride, halite. And you may not know this, but there are mines under the ground that have hundreds 
and hundreds of thick feet of salt. And this is an image from the Hockley salt mine that's near Houston, Texas. And here's the mine shaft right here. And this is pumping air from the surface down in. That's what that duct is for. And so miners retrieve halite or rock salt from it. And here's an example of halite from a mine, not the Hockley salt mine, but you can see it's pretty clear. If it was polished, it would be very clear. And just look at how it's broken. You can see that it breaks in nice cubic patterns there. Now, when it occurs naturally in massive deposits like this, it's interesting, a lot of times gypsum is near, maybe above, sometimes below the salt or halite. And actually, salt is often a word used to refer to anything that can dissolve in water that's easily soluble, like a gypsum is pretty easily dissolved. Sodium chloride is even more easily dissolved. A lot of people think these got here just from seawater evaporating. So if that was really formed from seawater evaporating, that seems kind of strange. Seawater has both sodium chloride. It's mostly sodium chloride, then some gypsum as well. But how would you get just this massive amount of gypsum? And that goes up for probably dozens of feet here, maybe hundreds of feet. And then below this is hundreds and hundreds of feet thick of sodium chloride. How did they just separate like that? Is evaporation of seawater really how this salt got here? And so that brings us to our next section. How are minerals formed? Well, most common minerals are formed from the two most common elements in the Earth's crust, silicon and oxygen. And those are known as the silicates. And so that includes quartz, which we've talked about already and then bigger named minerals like plagioclase feldspar. There's also potassium feldspar, mica, biotite, amphibole, and olivine. We'll talk more about these in part B. Now we also have non-silicate minerals as well. They're not as abundant in the Earth's crust, but remember the Earth's crust is thick and the Earth is huge, so there's still large quantities of these. And things like calcite, which is calcium carbonate, CA for calcium, and then C for carbon, O for oxygen. And this CO3 is called the carbonate compound. And there's gypsum and anhydrite. Both of those have calcium sulfate in them. Gypsum has more water stuck in the crystal structure. Remember, it's not wet. If you put a paper towel underneath it, it wouldn't soak up the water and become wet itself. It's not like that. It's it's different. The water is attached in the crystal structure in a way that it, it doesn't just soak out of it when you put a paper towel around it. And if we think of without water as meaning anhydrous. An means without. So anhydrite, that's basically gypsum with the water removed. And that happened probably through a heat-related process within the earth. And then there's halite, which we talked about already a lot, sodium chloride. Those are some common non-silicate minerals. Now, we still really haven't talked about how minerals form. Well, they form from several different processes. They form from magma. They form from chemical precipitation. That's where two different fluids or fluids with chemicals in them besides water, they interact and then the elements and compounds within there, those interact with each other and form a solid that sinks out of the liquid. And so it maybe it looks like rain sometimes, like a precipitation. And so that's why it's called chemical precipitation, but it's actually forming a solid. It's not a liquid that's falling out. And then there's also metamorphism. Minerals that already exist are altered in different ways. Or rocks that already exist, those are altered so that the minerals come out of them. And we know that minerals are the building blocks of rocks. Rocks are formed from one or more minerals. So if we look at this rock cycle, which we'll talk about more in part B, we have this thing called plutonism. And a pluton is basically a body of magma that's underneath Earth that hasn't come up through the surface to form lava. It solidifies underground. As it cools though, it forms different rocks like granite and within granite there will be different kinds of minerals. Granite is a rock. Minerals are what make up the rock. So minerals are formed when magma cools or when lava comes out or magma comes out and forms lava and then cools on the surface forming things like rhyolite. Rhyolite is a version of granite basically that's from the magma coming out onto the surface 
It just has a little bit different composition, different densities than granite does. Then you have some erosion that goes on, forming sediments. Then water might dissolve some of the minerals in that. And so we have mineral dissolution. Then later on, you might have mineral precipitation. And a lot of times that's how quartz is formed in veins in rocks. And there may be a crack in a rock. And water is flowing through that. And eventually quartz precipitates out of that solution that's flowing through. And if you get enough mineral stacked up together like in gypsum or salt, like sodium chloride salt, then you have a sedimentary rock that's considered a mineral rock. And then those can change through metamorphism as well. So the processes that form minerals are basically the same processes that form rocks most of the time. Okay, and then last in part A here is mineral shapes. And so let's look at these three different basic mineral shapes here. We can have one directional type of minerals where we call that basal or basal cleavage. Remember from your definitions that cleavage is the tendency to break, the tendency of a mineral to break along a plane. And a plane is just a flat surface. So sometimes minerals just break in layers. That's called one directional. Sometimes they'll break in two directions. So you have a flat surface there and then a vertical surface here. And then this side, it's just kind of bumpy. It doesn't really have a certain way that it breaks. And then you have three directional or cubic sometimes as well, where they'll break smoothly along one way, along a second way, and then along a third way as well, like a cube. So we have basal, we have prismatic, which is two directions, cubic, which is three directions. Now, something else to consider is that the same mineral, it can take on many sizes, shapes, and names. And a great example of this is gypsum. It has this foundational part that's called calcium sulfate, CaSO4. If you were to dissolve that in water, it forms calcium ions, which have a plus two charge. Remember, that means that they have two fewer electrons and they do protons and then it forms a sulfate ion which is a compound and that has a negative two charge which is what you would expect because when they come together then the charges balance out plus two and minus two equals zero now within gypsum there's these different types there's selenite which is in the example there you can see it's very clear and you can see the cleavage patterns there and then this is satin spar gypsum here, and it formed first probably right along this line right here. And then some of the crystals formed in this direction, others formed in that direction. And they basically have a prismatic cleavage pattern to them because you can break off little pieces that are flat on both sides. And then you have massive gypsum. This is several feet thick right here, but it doesn't really have any certain pattern to it like the satin spar did. That's also called rock gypsum sometimes. And then here's gypsite, and that's just kind of crumbly looking, real soft, white. And a lot of times that forms just where a pool has evaporated and left gypsum behind. And then here's a little bit harder form of gypsum called alabaster gypsum, and a lot of times that's used to make sculptures with. Sometimes it'll have some different colors in it too, some reddish or pinkish colors, and that gives it a little bit of a marbled appearance. And then we have plaster of Paris, which is not gypsum in terms of calcium sulfate with two waters. It has basically for every calcium sulfate, there's half a water molecule, but you can't have half a water molecule. That's just the nomenclature and the numbering system that's used here. So it'd really be for every two calcium sulfates, there's one water molecule. Usually you can buy that at the store or at a hobby store and it's in a powdered form and it will readily absorb water and it actually has a little chemical reaction that goes on in absorbing that water and heat is released and you'll feel it get warmer and actually it takes heat to remove the two water molecules from gypsum to get just the half and then it releases heat when you add the water back in. And then last is anhydrite. Remember, we talked about that already. Anhydrous, it doesn't have any water at all. And so there's been some 
probably some thermal alteration or it was formed in a way maybe under high temperature that it never had water to start with and so this example is where different layers alternating layers of anhydrite which is the white color and then an organic material was laid down in between and some researchers I think in error have said that these white layers where anhydrite was laid down that counted for basically one year and you could count these like tree rings and so each dark layer then a light layer that's one year's worth of evaporation of seawater basically and so that gypsum precipitated out forming anhydrite but if, what exactly is that organic layer and and we just don't know we don't know what processes were going on or that it actually took a year to form each layer and why aren't all the layers the same thickness if it took a year why are some so much more than others so lots of questions there difficult to know exactly how those layers got there okay well that's all for part a go ahead and pause your lecture and complete your homework set here's your solutions Problem four, you may have had some questions on that. Sediment transport and deposition is not a common mineral forming process. It's just a movement maybe of rocks or minerals or both from one place to another, but it doesn't really form any minerals. Not like precipitation would where you have a solution that has some dissolved compounds and those come together as the water evaporates to form a solid like halite or like a gypsum.